morning. It's my pleasure and honor and privilege to bring God's Word to you this morning. We're going to be studying from chapter 2 of 1 Peter. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 10. The title of my message is we'll begin this new series on the church. It's called Created for Community. That you are created for community. The title of my series is called Puzzled. Puzzled. Now, I do not, by using that word, I do not mean confused or bewildered, but I mean like a puzzle that you put together. That the church is many, many parts, as we're going to learn from the passage today, that we are, each one of us, individual stones, spiritual stones, that God wants to put together in what His body is called the church, to make up a spiritual house. A house that worships God, that serves God, and serves one another in love and in community. But if you're there in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'd ask you to stand to show honor and reverence at the reading of God's Word. And I want to really focus on verses 9 through 10. It's kind of the key verses, but I'm going to read the entire passage. And God's Word says this, And coming to Him, meaning Jesus, is to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, all of us, as living stones, and we are being built up together as a spiritual house, as a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, quoting Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. It says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, who we know to be Jesus Christ. And he who believes in Him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And in that ancient culture, as we saw the slides from Andy and Bonnie, you saw how buildings and these beautiful archways, this architecture, were fitted together even without mortar because they were put together in such a way, being held together by the chief cornerstone. That was the most important part of that building was the cornerstone. And so Christ as the cornerstone is the most important part of His church. For they stumble. Uh, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the Word. And to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out. And that is the church. We are called out people of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank You so much. For your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to be the chief cornerstone of His church, this spiritual house. Lord, I pray that everything said and done in this service today would bring glory and honor to Your name. That we would lift up the name of Jesus Christ in this place today. And that we would remember Him through partaking in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Lord, that we would reflect and remember the joy and the salvation that You brought in our lives if we are believers this morning. Be with us, Father. Teach us from Your Word. And again, I pray in Your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So this will be the first of five-week series on the church. Now, how many of you all like to put a puzzle together? I know that Brother Jimmy's putting one together now. And when you go on a vacation, right, or maybe when it's snowing and you can't go anywhere and there's not a whole lot to do, a lot of times what my family likes to do is put together a puzzle. Okay? We pass the time, we get the bond together, at least until the children get bored and, and they can't find all the little pieces. But the thing about it is we work together and we try to put that puzzle together. We try to find what? The four corner pieces first. Then we find what? The straight edges. But let me ask you this. If one piece is missing from that puzzle, that puzzle doesn't have a whole lot of value, does it? It doesn't. 
There's nothing more frustrating for me when we go and get like a 500 piece or one of those big thousand piece puzzles and then I find under the bed or under the couch a piece of that puzzle. Or maybe I don't even know maybe we got two or three puzzles for Christmas. I don't even know which puzzle he goes to. And you're having to fit together. I mean, how frustrating would it be to spend all that time putting together one of those huge thousand piece puzzles and realize one of the main pieces is missing? Well, that's just like God's house today. We are part of His house, His puzzle, so to speak. And every one of you, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are, I don't care if you're rich, I don't care if you're poor, or what language you speak, or the color of your skin, every single image bearer of Christ is important in God's kingdom. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says, We are made in God's image, every human being on planet Earth. And as image bearers of God, even though they may not agree with everything I believe or what you believe, they are still important because they're made in God's image. And we should show them love, we should show them respect, we should show them mercy, compassion, and by the way, we should show that same love, respect, and mercy to one another here as well. We should. Because we are also children of the same Father, are we not? God is our Father. That is our common identity as God's people. But what is Jesus doing in His world today? He is building His church. He is building His church. And guys, for us to portray the beautiful portrait that God has in store for His church, we must all work together. We must all come together. We must be united. We must be active participants in the ministry here or whatever ministry God calls us to serve. But I want you to know that God gave us the gift of His church in order for Him to fulfill His purpose for our lives. In other words, for us to fulfill the callings that God has placed on our lives, whether it's a calling to mercy ministry, a calling to serve people through preaching as I'm called to do, or pastoral ministry, to be a missionary, whether it's a missionary to your own family or a missionary overseas, we must be united and plugged in to God's church, His people, for that to happen. But but in order for us to grow spiritually through sanctification, we need the sharpening of each other. We need the prayers of each other. When one of us hurts, guess what, church? We all should hurt. When one of us celebrates, as we did yesterday at that wonderful party, what happens? All of us should celebrate. When one is sick, what should the rest do? Pray to bring soup, bring whatever to help that family. Because that's what we do as a family. We help one another and love each other and serve each other. But you can search as hard as you can in the Old Testament, but the word church, the word church is not mentioned until Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And the word church, according to the New Testament, means this. It comes from two Greek words, et kaleo. It means the called out. Et means out. Kaleo means to call. The called out people of God. That is who we are. And we're called out to live a different life. We're called out to be pilgrims, strangers in a foreign land as we see these culture wars going on all around us. And whenever you open the newspaper, is it usually good news that you read? It's not. There's a lot of bad news, isn't there? But the good news that we have as called out people of God as His church, as His spiritual house, is that this world is not our eternal home. We look forward to a city not made with human hands. It's a better place. A place where there's no more crying, no more tears, no more death, no more suffering, no more poverty, no more orphans, no more shame. That's the city we look forward to. But what do we know about 1 Peter? Well, if I could summarize 1 Peter with one word, it would be the word suffering. Peter is writing to the early church, a church that's enduring suffering under Nero, uh, the Emperor Nero, who had Christians thrown in the Colosseum to be eaten alive by lions, to be killed just for their pleasure to watch these people be murdered because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people were scared to death, as many of us would be, if we knew that our faith was going to cost us our lives. And right now we can come and sit in comfortable pews with heated buildings in this wonderful weather, but you know that it wasn't that long ago that what happened in Texas, right? We saw the the church shooting where people were worshiping God and a gunman comes in there and shoots those people down. This happened in South Carolina, not far away from us. Guys, the persecution is becoming more and more real. 
But some of you may have even had persecution from your own family. My wife comes from a tradition that does not believe the way we believe. And her own family members have persecuted her in some ways and persecuted our family in some ways because of what we believe. So even though somebody doesn't hold a gun to my head, when we sit across the table at Thanksgiving, if they come to my house, they know they're going to hear a Christian prayer. They know that they're going to hear the gospel preached, even from the dinner table as we share that meal together. And we should be missionaries even to our own families. Not saying that we're better than somebody else, but because we love those people, we care enough about them to show them the right way, to show them the truth, because we should not want anyone to spend an eternity separated from God. And so, because of the reality of heaven, the reality of hell, we are compelled to be God's witnesses, starting in our homes to the ends of this earth. But there are really two main points to our message today. Two main points. The first is that we were created, for those that are taking notes, we were created for community. We were created for community. And guys, our generation stands against this a lot of times. Our generation is what I call a generation of radical individualism. Radical individualism. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, we went to the grocery store last night on the way home. And what we saw at the grocery store was an advertisement at Food Line saying you can order your groceries online and they will deliver them to your door. Do you know that you can live without ever having to leave your house? You can have your laundry picked up and delivered to you. You can have your food uh, ordered and picked up and, and delivered to you. You can have your lawn cut in the summertime without ever having to go outside. You can literally live like a monk in a monastery and never see anybody. You can but that's not what God created us to do, is it? That is not the life that God created for us. He did not create us to live in isolation. God did not create us to live alone. God created us to live in community. In community. Now I know that some of us are living alone. And I know that it's hard and it's lonely. And that is why it's so important for us to have that vibrant community within the church. That is why it's important for us to call and take communion to our shut-ins and to do the things that we know we ought to do to encourage people that are lonely, that are hurting. You know, this time of year, the holidays, is a very hard time for a lot of people. It is. And so that's why it's so important for us to care enough about our loved ones, to care enough about our church members and our church family, to go and see them and to encourage them. But Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 tells us that it is not good for us to be alone. The Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. That word man in the original language means all of humanity. It's not just talking about a, a bachelor looking for a wife, right? It's talking about all of us. It's not good for us to live in isolation. We're created for community. And the words Peter uses here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 are words of community. Every word that we just read, whenever it says you, it means you plural. It is using group language, group terms. He's speaking to the entire church as he is writing here. They are all plural. Every single one of them is a group word. Peter says in verse 5 that we are a spiritual house, a building. And in ancient architecture, as I said earlier, that building was not supported like we have today with mortar or with rebar, right? It's supported with a cornerstone that was laid out in the architectural design of that building in such a way that all the other blocks rested upon that cornerstone and had their weight and their purpose around that cornerstone. And guys, this morning I'm here to tell you, as the pastor of Mays Chapel Baptist Church, that our cornerstone, the chief stone of this church, the chief stone that ought to be of your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shouldn't be us. It shouldn't be anything else. Put the center our finances or our titles or our education. It ought to be the Lord Christ. And everything that we do ought to be centered around that chief cornerstone. Because that's how we are to build our life. That is how we are to live as believers. He tells us that we are each one blocks in this spiritual house. Now, if I had a brick, you know, I live, I live in Sanford, Lee County, which is our claim to fame used to be that we were the brick capital of the world. But you know, those brick, those brick factories are closed down. You know, one right down from my house, it's like it's been raised to the ground because no one's because of our economy being bad in years past. They, they had to lay off all the people and now that, that factory's gone. But if you take an individual brick and set it down, Brother Ray, it's not really going to be able to do much, is it, on its own? It's not very strong. I can take that brick, pick it up, and throw it, right? Now, if I had another brick laying on top of it, it's a little bit stronger, but I can still pick them up and throw them. But, Brother, when you start getting that mortar and laying it out, when you start putting that brick upon brick and a skilled mason can even make it decorative, we can't go out and pick up that bank down the road, can we? We can't go up and pick up 
you know, the, the church sign out there made of all those rocks, can we, brother? We can't because it's built on a foundation. Imagine we are individual stones this morning, individual bricks, and in and of ourselves, we can't do very much. We cannot hold up much. We can't, you know, bear the burden of, of, of a lot of weight on us. But man, when we start working together, when we start stacking the talents and the skills that God has given each and every one of us, then what happens? There's power in that. There's power in community. There's the Spirit working through us. And if I were to take a pencil and ask my boys to come up, they could probably smack it on their own, couldn't they? But if I took two pencils, three pencils, four pencils, if I took ten pencils, there's not a man in this room that could break those. There's power in community. But he goes on to say in verse 9 that we are a chosen race. And this does not mean ethnicity or skin color. In other words, God is not the God of the white people. God is not the God of the black people. God is a God of all people. I don't care what color or how much or how little melanin you have in your skin. God is the God of all. He is a God for all nations. That He is a God for all people. And as we think about John 3.16, for God so loved North Carolina, for God so loved America, for God so loved Africa, no, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, and don't you thank God for that word, whosoever, that means there's hope for me. That means there's hope for you. That means there's hope for all of us no matter what we've done in our past. No matter what mistakes we've made, there's hope in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And that encourages me. That allows me to wake up even when I don't feel like getting out of bed and serving God for what He did for me. He tells us that we are a holy priesthood, a chosen race. And for any of you that have come from a religious background, that makes a distinction between the priests of God and the regular church members. Okay, I want you to know that that is unbiblical. Because there is nothing special about me. There, I am no closer to God than any other believer in this room. I'm not above you. I stand up here, I, I guess just the way the architecture, people build pulpits on kind of a platform. But I want you to know that there's nothing special about Red Lamb. I want you to know that you have the same access to God the Father that I do. We do not need a special priest to intercede between us and our Father God. We have direct access for Jesus Christ and what He did. We can come to the Father boldly, the Bible says, as a child. Let me ask you this for you parents or grandparents, okay? How many of you have been woken up in the middle of the night by crying like a little, a little baby or kid, right? Every one of us, right? Let me ask you this. In, a, in, in the first century, when Jesus walked the earth, what do you think would have happened to someone, a stranger, just coming into the kingdom, to the palace? Maybe even King Herod coming in there and waking him up at four in the morning. What would happen to them? They'd be killed. They'd be killed. Don't you know that we have the kind of love, the kind of grace, the kind of compassion that God gave us that we can boldly come to God at any time and at any place, no matter what condition we're in, crying out, maybe we're sick with the flu or you know, having a really bad night and crying out to God. Isn't that awesome? We can worship God in such a way that He loves us so much that His children can even walk before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and do so boldly. That is an amazing truth of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that this holy priesthood is made up of all people that would call Jesus Lord. That He would be the one true God of the Bible. But there are some people that I've talked to in the community that say this. They say, I don't need the church. I have the Bible. I've been baptized. And I have the Holy Spirit. I can worship God at home. Well, let me tell you this. You can survive without the fellowship and community of the church. But you can't thrive apart from God's people and apart from God's church. You can survive. In other words, you can go about being a Christian, but you will not thrive apart from community. You're not going to have the prayers of the people. People aren't going to encourage you. They are not going to know what's going on in your life or you're disconnected from the, the people of God. And more importantly, you're not going to hear the testimonies of how God's working in the lives of other people, which encourages me so much. Your praises every Sunday morning, I want you to know, 
but it's like putting a fresh energizer battery in this pastor's heart to hear how God is working in your lives every week. It encourages me to know how I can pray for you as your pastor. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. And by the way, it's what you're supposed to do also. Going to church, being a church member is not golf, right? I mean, golfers, they are, it's an individual sport. They get up there, they hit that ball, they're responsible for their own outcome, right? They practice. But it's a solo sport. Swimming, same kind of thing. But think of the church as more of a basketball team. Or a football team. Or a baseball team. You gotta work together, right? You have to have a hind catcher. The pitcher by himself gets up there and throws that ball. There's nobody to catch it. They're always going to get a run, aren't they? Have you ever seen a pitcher hit? <laughs> it's kind of ugly. They don't hit too good. They need that designated hitter. They need the outfielder. They need the third baseman, right? But it's not a solo sport. It's a team effort. But look at what he says in verse nine. What Peter says. He says, "Holy nation." That the people of God are a holy nation. And going back again to that sports metaphor, you know, we hear about the Tar Heel Nation. We hear about the Wolf Pack Nation. And where I come from in East Tennessee, we hear about the Volunteer Nation. Everybody wants to be a nation that gathers around their favorite team. Well, the church is also like that. But we're called to be a holy nation. A nation that does not see the the need to go to a sports stadium on Sunday is more important than coming to fellowship and with God's people. I know that steps on some toes. But it's the truth. We're to be a holy nation. A nation whose sole purpose is to please and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We were once just a crowd, folks, doing things on our own. Going around, you know, doing our own thing. A crowd of individuals just... Wandering around aimlessly. But guys, God now has gathered us together here this morning and gifted us through His Holy Spirit to do His work. You were created for community. Don't try to live the Christian life on your own. A few years ago, there was a woman named Geraldine Largate uh, who walked the Appalachian Trail. She was doing a through hike all the way from Springer Mountain, Georgia to Mount Cotton in May. It's about 20... 200 miles on foot. She's 66 years old at this time. Trying to walk the Appalachian Trail. She had a friend that went with her. Okay, so there were two of them. About the same age. They were very healthy and fit for their age. But still they were 66. And they had a good trip. They'd almost made the whole journey. And then her friend, her name was Jane, she had an ailment. She hurt her ankle, I believe it was, or her knee, and had to drop off the trail. But Geraldine was hard-headed. Her husband, who was not accompanying her because he wasn't able to do this because of his health, but he begged her to come home and stop. Just come home. You don't need to do this on your own. But she was very prideful. She did not want to walk 2,000 miles and give up when there's only 200 more left to go. Isn't that like us today? Hard-headed, right? I know I am. But she didn't take the advice of her husband and her friends who told her. So she left the hotel to start the next journey. Because what she would do is she would every now and then meet her husband. He was keeping up with her. They had communication. He would meet her at a certain stop along the Appalachian Trail, help her you know, get the food, supplies she needs, get a hot shower, and a, maybe stay in a hotel if it's real cold one day. But she left, get this, she left her GPS locator in that hotel that day. That was a very bad mistake. And she goes on the trail and realizes that she's lost. She goes off the trail to use the restroom. And gets lost because those last 200 miles are the hardest 200 miles of that entire trail. Because the underbrush in the summertime is so thick, you can't see from here to that door. It's so thick. And she got lost without a GPS locator, without a way to contact her husband because there was no service or reception on her cell phone there. And you know what? To add insult to injury, she did not know how to read a compass. She had a compass and did not know how to use it. But yet she's going on this dangerous, dangerous trail on her own. Rather than do what she should have done, which is keep walking around until you find another hiker or until you get on the trail, she decided to build camp and wait it out. We know that no one came to help her. She died 50 yards away from the main trail and didn't even know it was there because she didn't venture out. She wanted to stay by herself and do things her way. And she paid the ultimate price, which was her life. They found her body two years later, and a little note scribbled out to her husband saying, I should not have done this on my own. I should not have done this.
should not have done this on my own. Guys, we were created for community. And if you've been brought to life in Christ, you will never reach your maximum potential in Christ apart from the church. This brings us to our second and final biblical truth. That you can survive without community, but you cannot thrive without community. If you are saved, you are going to heaven. And please don't misunderstand me and don't misconstrue what I'm saying. The church and being a church member does not save you. It doesn't. Being baptized does not save you. What does save you? It is grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is, it is the gift of God. And if we could do it on our own, guess what it says? All of us would boast. We would. Can't do it on our own. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ are we saved. But we will not thrive in life unless we are plugged into God's community, which is the church. Serving Christ by serving others. And guys, there are three reasons, for those of you who are taking notes, there are three reasons why we need community this morning. Three reasons. The first one is affection. Affection. As Christians, we want to love what Jesus loved. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved His church and gave Himself up for her. What does that mean? Well, He died for His church. How much did Jesus love the church? He died for the church. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we will love the church because Jesus loves His bride, the church. It is completely unbiblical to say, I love Jesus, but I do not love His church. You get that? That is a contradiction in terms. The church is flawed, yes. Some people tell me that they don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, I'm here to say I've met some hypocrites in the church and guess what? I've been a hypocrite at certain points in my life, okay? But God still loves His church. His plans to reach the nations for Christ, His great commission is based upon the church fulfilling that command, working together. This does not mean, again, that we're going to be perfect. It's a daily struggle. We all have our own problems, our own idiosyncrasies, our own habits and things. But we're called to live life together in community. So number one is affection. Number two, protection. In the Good Samaritan story of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, we see a man that tried to go things on his own. This was a Jewish man, and he walked you know, down from Jerusalem. He was going to do business most likely, and he chose to go it alone. Just like that Geraldine Largay woman. It didn't work out too well for him either, did it? Because thieves were on that road. And they beat him down. They stole everything he had. Even took his clothes. Left him beaten, naked, and half dead, the Bible says. And then we know the story. The priest walks by and doesn't help him. The Levite walks by and doesn't help him. And the least likely person to help this man helps him, the Samaritan. Because Jewish people and Samaritans didn't like each other very much. But this man saw somebody in need. This man saw somebody who needed compassion, who needed a hand up from their situation. And he gave him his own beast to ride. He bandaged his wounds and even was willing to play an open tab to the end to take care of this hurting man. In our day to day, it'd be like us finding a homeless person on the side of the road that needs desperate medical attention and us handing the hospital emergency room our credit card saying, whatever bills you need to pay for this man, they're covered and let me know if I need to pay more. That'd be an equivalent. To that story today. How many of us are willing to do that? But that's what God calls us to do. He says, go and do likewise in Luke chapter 10 verse 37. Go and do likewise. You see, we can't go it alone. We can survive, but we cannot thrive apart from community. So we see affection and protection. And one of the examples that God has given me in my own life of protecting others is through the treasure chest ministry. My family, for those that don't know, for you guys that don't know, uh, we, we have a ministry where we help homeless and at-risk families. Uh, it started out as a Christmas ministry, but now we have an Easter ministry and different things throughout the year that we do. And one of the families we were able to serve was a family that was from the Ukraine originally that had moved to Sanford, relocated to Sanford, and were in dire need of, of help. Uh, her name was Svetlana, and she had a daughter named Lisa who had been sexually abused by her dad for many years. And they had no advocate. They had nobody helping them. And she just, more or less, God just put her in our life to help her. And we did. And they gave their lives to Christ. And I had the privilege and honor of baptizing both her and Lisa. 
and to help her legally get out of the situation she was in and protect her with restraining orders on the man who had done so much harm and evil in that family's life. But again, guys, what if I chose not to help? What if I chose not to obey the calling of God to do that ministry and never met her? What would have happened? I don't know. But I do know this, that God calls us to love each other and to protect each other. And we're to show affection towards other people, to be fathers to the orphans and to be comforters to the widows and helpers to those in need. But affection, protection, and third correction. Guys, cults are founded by people who read the Bible, but they refuse to be held accountable for their teachings and holding to the apostles' doctrine. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see the portrait of the early church. It says they came under the apostles' doctrine. Okay? You can't just hold a Bible up and, and say, I know what this means if the Holy Spirit is not inside of you and the Holy Spirit is not working and illuminating God's Word to you. You must be putting yourself under the teachings of Jesus Christ and the teachings that God has given us and revealed to us in His Word. And when we stray from that, then we've lost the Gospel. And that was the front and center in the early church and it ought to be front and center for us today. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, God's Word says this, And He, meaning God, gave some to be apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So every one of us has a member, as a member, has a role to play. Uh, some are more up front, some are more behind the scenes, but we all have uh, a role to play. And the, the purpose of that is to build up the body of Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, 15, the Bible says, Beware of the false prophets who came to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And guys, we need our church and other church members to help us stay on the path. Just like Geraldine Largay strode off the path, we must not stray off the path of right doctrine, of the right teachings about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even the way we live our lives, we're to hold each other accountable to keep us from being led astray. So my challenge to you this morning, if you're not a part of God's church, actively giving and actively serving, I want you to know that there is a place for you here at Mays Chapel Baptist Church. We have many ministry holes, so to speak, that need to be filled. And maybe God has chosen you to fill that place, to fill that ministry and that role here. And guys, God has so graciously given us His best gift, His Son, Jesus Christ. And we should be willing to give the gift that we have to give, which is our lives, our very lives, because of what God has so graciously done for us. We are to make up this puzzle that God calls His church. And we're to do that together. So that's my appeal to you. I want you to know, for those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that He loves you. And He died for you to keep you from going to a place called hell. Eternal separation from God. And He lived a perfect life, the only human being that ever did that. And He died a horrific death on the cross of Calvary as we're about to observe His remembrance through the Lord's Supper. But He did that to reconcile us, to bring us back to God the Father who loves us. And it doesn't just stop with us, by the way, because Christ is returning. And because He's returning to this earth, not only as a, He did come as a little baby in a manger, but one day He will return as a judge. He will return as a righteous judge. As King of kings and as Lord of lords to set this world straight. And because He's returning, He compels us to be working while it is still daytime, because now time is coming when no one can work. So I love you. For our visitors, you're not our visitors, you're our guests, and you're most welcome. And if God has spoken to you this message, I want you to know that this 